Brian Hamilton, thank you so much for having me back in your podcast loop. I have loved being interviewed by you. I think it was seven times if I'm not mistaken. So here we are back together. I want to share with you a really powerful opportunity to boost resiliency in organizations. And that is the Nurses Week Resiliency Reboot. Now, I know that you're all security experts, so you may be thinking, why are we talking about Nurses Week? Well, two reasons. Number one, so many of you know the value of celebrating milestones. So I hope you will help me spread the word that there is this really powerful, done for you Nurses Week celebration. It's got the education with an amazing speaking colleague of mine, Stephanie Staples, a rewired nurse, resiliency expert. We've joined forces. I'm a recognition expert. We're going to make sure nurses feel valued, supported, and have so many tools to feel more resourceful in this challenging time. So please, please spread the word. The other reason I wanna mention it is that this doesn't have to be just for nurses. All of your security professionals and the other departments you work with, why not make this one huge connective experience? Hospitals and facilities across North America, perhaps even across the world, could all benefit from a boost of resiliency. Would you not agree? And if we do it together, and if we take some of the burden off of you as busy leaders, I think we can make this happen really quickly. What do you think? I hope you will check it out. Visit us, learn more about what we're trying to do. Please spread the word. And if nothing else, just remember, Nurses Week is coming up, or the first part of May, varies a little bit country to country. Just please, please make sure you reach out to as many nurses as possible and say thank you, thank you. I appreciate you being on my team. Be sure to subscribe to the Healthcare Security Cast so you don't miss a single episode. We're on multiple platforms, including Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, and Audible, just about anywhere where you can listen to a podcast. For links to all of these sites, for links to join the Healthcare Security Cast community groups on LinkedIn and Facebook, or if you're interested in being a guest or being a sponsor, you can find all of this through one link. Check out our link tree at linktree slash Brian Hamilton. That's L I N K T R dot ee slash brian b-r-i-n-e hamilton again that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot ee slash brian hamilton and before we get into the show i just want to thank our sponsors 3d network technology reliability is our core value visit 3d network technology.com and genetech delivering security strategies for healthcare visit genetech that's g-e-n-e-t-e-c dot com and also the Change Execution Group and 360 Life Transformations. Visit 360lifetransformations.com. Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast, the podcast dedicated to healthcare security, safety, and emergency management. If you are involved with a healthcare security program or desire to be, this podcast is for you. Join the conversation as we discuss the issues that matter to healthcare security professionals while leveraging the expertise of healthcare security thought leaders and experts in personal development. And now, here's your host, Brian Hamilton. Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast for Tuesday, March the 30th. I'm joined today by Christopher Johnston. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me on, Brian. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be with you. Now, I, I always like to start off by learning about the, the individual that we're speaking with today. So I'll first start by asking, who is Chris Johnston? <laughs> uh, so I'm the, uh, my title is the Director of Security and Safety for St. Joseph's Health. I try to think of myself as an experienced security executive with a very big focus, large focus on technology and customer service. Uh, I always, I also have the uh, pleasure of overseeing the parking division, which brings me into contact with our visitors, our patients and employees on a completely different level than when it comes to the security and safety portion of my job. But before any and all of that, you know, I'm a father and a husband. I'm really, really fortunate, lucky enough to have three absolutely amazing children and an incredible wife. Uh, I really don't know how I got to be that lucky with 
them with my with my family. You know, coming home to them is fantastic every day. You know, I, I'm a big big country fan. Uh, so you know, one of my favorites is Kenny Chesney. And you know, as as he says, you know, that's the good stuff when you get to come home to them. So I mean, I love my job. You know, I love coming to work every day for St. Joe's. It really is an amazing organization, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. But you know, again, you know, obviously, you know, my family is just. They're really the reason I do all of that. Excellent. Now, as far as, um, and, and that's awesome to hear. Like, I can really echo that sentiment too. My family is is everything for me. And, you know, I feel the same way. I don't know how I've been as lucky as I have been to be where I am in, uh, you know, in, in that context. But yeah, definitely. I, you know, maybe maybe it's just the, the line of work that we're in. You're doing good things for the world. And it's that, that karma that comes back to you. <laughs> now, I, I guess the next thing I want to jump into is your career. Because you talked about where you, where you are now. What was it that led to you getting into healthcare security and, and this position that you're in right now that, that you enjoy so much? Well, you know, coming out of high school and going into college, I, I always had a love of law. I, at one point, I thought I want to be a lawyer. I, at one point, I thought I want to be a doctor. At one point, I wanted to be an English professor. But everything drew me back to the law or law enforcement. And there's a line in my family that has law enforcement, the NYPD, New Jersey State Police. And so it really always drew me to that. And, you know, I, I got into law enforcement, absolutely loved it. Absolutely. It was one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. And I still have friends, classmates from, from my academy and my coach, the guy who trained me, you know, I still keep in contact. My first sergeant at my first station, when it came to my wedding, you know, I, I still love those guys. But I, I got out of law enforcement. I got hurt, unfortunately. But, um, and I said, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. So I, I said, well, let me just try my hand at security. It sounds similar. I thought maybe I would work some odd jobs and go back to school, you know, get my master's. And then I knew someone that was in security from, or had friends in the family in security. And I reached out, made a contact. And then I interviewed with a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Catullo from Gateway Group One in Newark, New Jersey. And kind of the rest is, this, as they say, is history. I just kind of rolled with it from there. I never thought I was going to just go into management in that fashion. I was always the guy in the field. I liked that. And now I find myself behind a desk. And I like that too. So um, it, it was a little bit of a winding path, but I, I really enjoy, enjoyed it. And I like where I am now. Awesome. Now, you, you know, you alluded to it a little bit with that last answer, but who are, who are the people who've really helped you get to where you are in your career, like as far as influencers or, or right. mentors? So it definitely starts with Bobby Catullo, who was my last lieutenant in the state police. And then um, Jimmy Catullo was the gentleman, his, his brother that I interviewed with, just met and interviewed with at, for a gateway. And they, you know, I, I guess you can say they're responsible for getting me into uh, private security, contract security. And of course, Mr. Delermo, who was the owner of Gateway Group One for he, he started it, he owned it, and he passed away several years ago. But that, that was one of the, the individuals that, you know, definitely got me into it and I looked up to. But I would say as a mentor, someone that really, I guess, kind of I, I owe everything to is Alan Muscarella. Alan was, the, was a captain in York Police uh, before he retired. He then, when I met him, he was the director of security operations for Gateway, and eventually he, he was my boss. He has moved on since to, uh, he became the director of global security operations for Prudential in uh, Newark. And uh, it's just, he's an amazing man. He always looked out for me. He treated me very much like a son and used to bust my chops all the time. It was a, <laughs> it was a great give and take relationship. I owe him probably everything. I can remember he had this, I say it's annoying, but it's endearing too. He had this annoying habit of calling me kid or the kid. <laughs> I mean, I was 26 at the time when I, when I started working for him. So yeah, he went as far as to write Christopher, the kid Johnston on my first set of business cards. And I still have that business card, you know, like tucked away just to kind of look at and remind myself. But um, Alan Muscarella was definitely the guy that I, um, I would say I owe everything to. Uh, that really taught me and took me under his wing. Excellent. Now, obviously, as we as we get into our discussion today, we're going to be talking about a, a few items, but we'll start off by discussing, you know, how you've been able to work cohesively with your local law enforcement and 
obviously I'm sure your, your past experience really, really helps make that a, a good transition. How right. have you been able to successfully collaborate with your local law enforcement? So it's, it's kind of, it's tough. I mean, it helps that I understand law enforcement, at least I think I do. Law enforcement has a really specific mission. They have a specific job to do. But liaising with them, in my opinion, boils down to working with them to understand healthcare security or healthcare needs and expectations. And I think that's, it's pretty standard across the system that if you want someone to do a good job or work with you in a specific capacity, they need to know what you're looking for. And I need to know what their expectations are as well. I'm exceedingly fortunate to work with outstanding leaders in law enforcement. I mean, it starts at the top and they set the tone for how the department, the organization is going to be. You know, Jerry Spezial, uh, who's the director of public safety for Patterson, Chief Bacor, who's the chief of Patterson Police, Sheriff Richard Burdnick and Under Sheriff Darrell Walton from Passaic County, and Chief Jack McNiff from Wayne Police in New Jersey. They're amazing individuals that they're not just the, the guy that is going to be up in the ivory tower that's going to tell the guys on the road or the girls on the road, the individuals on the road, what they should and shouldn't do. They're going to get their hands dirty. They are leaders and we have a good back and forth. It's give and take. It's a collaboration. Nothing is ever perfect, but there's always continued conversations about the needs of not only law enforcement, but the healthcare system and its patrons and realistic goal, realistic goal setting. What are we looking for? What are we here to do? Because again, law enforcement has a different set of goals than does healthcare. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to keep our area, our people, the communities as safe as possible. And I can tell you from experience that law enforcement has an exceedingly tough job. And definitely in the present climate, they get painted with a very broad brush. So how do we fix that? How do we make sure that, you know, the police are happy, healthcare is happy, St. Joe's, the patrons, the communities that they are there to serve are happy. Open lines of communication between the police and those that they work with on a day in and day out basis. You know, we have a very intricate relationship. You know, we need them to be there for us. They need us to be there for them. We have to make sure that we work together. How do you do that? How do you consistently keep that level of dialogue open? We started to work with St. Joe's started to work with community members, a specific agency called Reimagining Justice. And this group is their work is centered around driving inner city citizens away from gangs, guns, narcotics, and so on, helping them make better choices so that they quote unquote get out of the life, that they don't make a choice that puts them, that gets them hurt, gets them locked up. So when we sat down, Reimagine Justice, St. Joe's, you know, my security team, administration. Guess who else was at the table with us? Local PD and local fire department. They were at the table and they were willing participants to keep lines of communication open and break down barriers. How do you, you know, some individuals didn't understand just how to get their identification or things that were taken from them if they were locked up or if they had charges against them. How did they get those things back? So just a quick example of it, but it's able to give individuals an understanding of what law enforcement has to do and so that they can work better with them. And at the end of the day, if people are working a little bit more closely with law enforcement, if we don't have that constant tension, you know what be, it's great is hopefully we'll see a decrease in those individuals coming to our ERs hurt. You know, if we can reduce institutional violence or community violence and people are working together and they're establishing a trust with not just the healthcare system, but local law enforcement, hopefully we'll get a better product out of it. We'll get a better result. We don't want individuals coming into our EDs in, with, with traumas that we don't want people losing their lives. So if they break down those barriers and open up lines of communication, I think all, you know, all around is going to improve. Excellent. Now, in terms of working with your your local PD, I understand that you know you do have some police presence on on location. What what has been the impact of that? I think it's been a very positive one overall. I think we've been fortunate enough to have law enforcement working with us in our emergency department. 
our staff, our, our frontline staff, likes seeing the extra assistance, the uniform. My security team feels as if there's another big resource there with them at a moment's notice. If we ever had to quote unquote push the button and get more because there's, let's say there's some type of adverse event, you know, we're going to get a response quickly so that we can secure the area and make sure that our patrons, our visitors, our patients are as safe as possible. I think it has, it has helped forge a stronger bond, a connection between our law enforcement around and the healthcare system. I do also think that St. Joseph's, let's just take the Patterson location. It's very, it, it's, a, it's a large inner city. We're one of the busiest ERs in the country. And some individuals from the community treat it as if it's a walk-in clinic because they will come there for, for a lot of different things, not just for an emergency room visit. That, that's fine. I mean, we want to be there for them, but we want them to feel that they're safe. They're coming in. If they're coming at two o'clock in the morning, that's an emergency. We want them to know it's okay to come in. We want them to feel like we're there for you. We're going to protect you. And it's, I think it's nice that they see not only my security team, but that there's someone from law enforcement there that can help. If they need, if they need to ask them a question, if they need to, hey, you know, this is what happened the other day. What should I do about that? You know, Patterson Wing cops, they, they are, some of them get a, I shouldn't say some, all of them, they get a bad rap. They're good, good, upstanding, moral officers. And they work their tails off to try to make sure that, you know, the city, the community feels safe. And I, I really think that them being there is a very positive presence. Absolutely. And I would, I would agree with you in terms of law enforcement. I feel like a lot of law enforcement just tend to get a, a bad rap because of a few things that get really, it really get a lot of attention in the media. But, it, you know, unfortunately, those stories where the police do a really good job, there's just their regular day to day interactions that are positive. Right. There, there's one video, for example, on YouTube, it's called uh, Honest Cop. It's a, it's a cop here, kind of local to where I am in Hamilton. And he spends a lot of time really dealing with a, a, a group around him. He's making an arrest of a young female, mm -hmm. but he's, he's addressing the group around him in a really positive manner. You know, he's not using any excessive force. He, he talks through the whole process. And, you know, that video, unfortunately, doesn't have as many views as, as some of these other ones that are, that are on YouTube. And it's not to say that there aren't individuals in law enforcement or in any line of work that, you know, don't do the wrong, wrong thing, because there are individuals that, unfortunately, will use their power or their, their abilities to things that they shouldn't do. Absolutely. And I got to tell you, I've never worked with another cop that has said, I'm okay with a bad cop. I, you know, I'm okay with a, a corrupt cop. You know, you don't really get that. And I wouldn't want to work with them. And I, if there are individuals that do those types, types of things, they need to be held accountable. And that's the only way, again, holding people accountable, open uh, lines of communication is how we re restore trust and willingness to work with each other. And I, I'm positive that law enforcement gets that. You know, they go out there, they put their butts on the line every single day. No, definitely. Uh, in a lot of ways, a really, a really thankless job for a lot of important and necessary work that's that's being done. Now, in terms of the the relationship with, you know, with your local PD as well as your local fire services, the 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 one thing you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the 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 group that you were working with, reimagining justice, was that both police and fire were at the table. Now, is, is that more of a, is that a formalized process or is that kind of something that you've done informally? How, how does, what does that look like? That's a, that's a formal process. We've had several, we had several pre-meetings before anything was rolled out. You know, again, with uh, PD, FD, leaders in the area. I even believe that there was some individuals from the city of Patterson, from the mayor's office that were working with us because it's an important aspect. So it was definitely a very formal regimented, this is how we're going to do things. This is going to be the process going forward. Now that it's out there, we'll have, you know, quarterly wrap ups and see how we're doing. What do we need to make changes to? What's the process? Does everyone have the correct education or the, or the, when I say education, meaning the individuals within our healthcare system, do they know this is who reimagining justice is? This is what their role is when they come to the healthcare system. This is what they should be doing, shouldn't be doing. Does everyone, is everyone on the same page so that they can get their job done and we can get our jobs done? So that, that it's a very formal process um, at first and now a little bit more of informal in terms of wrapping up and making sure that we're still 
going well. Uh, when we were, when we started just with talking with uh, law enforcement in the area, it was definitely a little more formal at first, where we would just, we would sit down and talk with them. You're in the conference rooms. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, and that's great. But, it, you know, everyone's on their, <laughs> their best behavior and sir and ma'am, and they got a tough job. We got a tough job. And, you know, there's no time to sugarcoat things. And so now it's more of, they can call me, I can call them whenever there's a need or an issue or a question. They know I'll pick up the phone and I know that I'll get help from them, from them or get a clarification to what occurred if I need it. Neither party, and I think this is key, neither party is afraid to be blunt and honest. That's a sign of a good relationship. If I have a problem with something that maybe an officer did or didn't do, you know, I will talk to them about that and vice versa. If they say, hey, what happened when my officer came in there with the subpoena? How can, hey, this is what happened. This is the process. This is what we need to do going forward. So it, it always comes down to open and honest communication. Otherwise, you're, you're going to go in circles. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, the one thing I kind of want to um, shift focus and move to is, is workplace violence and especially with the, in terms of technology, because you mentioned earlier when you were introducing yourself to us that technology is something that you're very interested in as well. So in, in terms of, the, in terms of check technology, what are some of the ways that technology has played a role in the, the reduction of workplace violence in, in your organization? So, you know, technology to me is, we're on, in my opinion, St. Joseph's Health, you know, the security department is, is really on the cutting edge. I'll put it up against any other organization or department in the area or in New Jersey. I'm definitely bragging a little bit, but I, I believe in it. But you got to make sure that you don't just throw money at something to try to fix the problem. How's you have to fit the solution for that area. You know, it, my systems manager, his name is Israel Payne. He's a great guy. Um, and I'll talk more about them a little bit later, but you know, he'll look at a, an area, he'll do a risk assessment and he'll say, you know, I can put 20 cameras in this area and I'll get 95% improvement on coverage and be able to see X, Y, and Z. And then we'll go back and we'll challenge it and say, yeah, but do we need that much? Or do we need a specific type of camera that's going to fit that area, the solution? How will it, what will make it work best and be most efficient? And that's, I think the key, whenever you're looking at any type of target hardening or improvement or, or technology, you know, access control is critical so that, you know, anyone who's, who's a security expert or security individual or healthcare security or, or any other type of security knows that access control, qualifying, being very, very selective of who can go into a certain area definitely helps you in reducing workplace violence. That's something that, that's, that's big. CCTV and all the bells and whistles that go in with that. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit, but what can CCTV do other than just be the eye in the sky? It's great as a deterrent, great for investigations, but what else can it do? The integration between both access control and CCTV. Those two, if your two systems don't work or can't work together, why are you running them? Why do you even have them? Don't have two standalone systems. Can they work together? But example, if we have a panic alarm pulled, in a specific area, our, our psych area, our ED administration, wherever it might be, the camera closest to that area will come up with 15 seconds of footage that's been recorded and then the live view. So we know what's, so we can have an eye on what's going on. That gives us the opportunity to qualify. Did someone make a mistake or do we have a real situation there? How many resources do we need to send? Do we need to get law enforcement? Is it a hazardous material spill and we need to activate some type of uh, facility alert? You know, we have to know what's going on so we can efficiently and quickly respond. Visitor management system, it's, it's so critical uh, these days. I need to know who's coming into the facility. I need to be able to flag individuals that we've had an issue with, put them on you know, a, a red list that they need to be qualified and held and or security escorted. I don't wanna let someone back in the facility that whacked a patient or hit a nurse or intimidated someone. You start doing that. And we're not the bullies, we're not the, we're not the bouncers, we're not gonna intimidate someone, but we do want you to know that while you're on property, you do need to act a certain way. There's a, you know, if you wanna call it a social contract, you come onto our property, private property, 
you have to make sure you stay in accordance with our policies and procedures. You can't yell and scream. I don't want you upsetting the patient you're coming to visit. I don't want you upsetting the other patients or visitors or employees. That's just, that's not okay. It's supposed to be a place of healing. And I understand that there is a time to grieve and a time to act out. And we're, we're fine with that. But you know, when we're using foul language and when we're, you know, intimidating or threatening or bullying someone, no, that's just, that's not what we're about. It's not what we're going to let people do in this environment. Workplace violence in healthcare is one of the largest trends. It's one of the biggest attractors for morale, for people that want to go into healthcare, for retention. So if you can decrease that, um, it, it's, it's a tremendous a tremendous uh, goal. There was a physician in, I think, Philadelphia um, that was reported maybe a week and a half ago that was lacerated and or had suffered a laceration on the face from a patient. It was in the emergency room and it, it can be busy. I, I'm, I understand that, but it shouldn't be a common thing. It shouldn't be, well, it's just the way it goes. No, I, I, I challenge that. That's not okay. Um, you know, as I talked about CCTV before, artificial intelligence, you know, what else can our cameras do than be the eye in the sky? So again, love technology, huge nerd with it. What we try to push here is facial recognition. If we're looking for a specific individual, we know someone that uh, stole something, broke something, threatened someone. I want to know when they come back on property. And is it qualifying? Is it profiling? A hundred percent. But we are looking for a specific individual that did something specific and we can qualify them and understand what they're, why they are here. Are they here for a legal and lawful reason? Fine. They're going to play by the rules? Fine. If they're just going to try to come back on property and do something they shouldn't do or harass someone? No, we don't, we're not going to do that. But AI will give us an edge, that extra couple of seconds, minutes, gives us the information, the data that, is, that will help us drive our patrol areas, our um, security areas, our life safety patrols, any of all, and all that is a big push forward in keeping our employees and patients and visitors safe. You know, and then there's a couple other items that we really have invested into, which is threat notifications and security intelligence. So we've subscribed to a couple services where we will do daily security briefings with my command staff and then look at all the incidents that are occurring in the last X number of hours so we can give that to not only our guys on patrol or guys on, on, on the site, but then if there's any affected areas, um, a quick example, we saw, and, and it's, it's sourced by first responders. So it comes out, we see that, you know, hazmat responding to, you know, 1.5 miles away from the facility. Well, what we saw was that there was a, and it turned out to be a dumpster fire about 1.9 miles away from the facility, and that there was allegedly hazardous materials that were involved in, that were on fire. Well, what does that say to me? That we could get patients in the form of individuals from that area or first responders that are going to be coming into my facility with possible exposure to hazardous materials. We have to let the ED know. We have to let emergency preparedness know. We need to let environmental services know. Do we set up a decontent? Get ahead of it. If you can get ahead of it, you're going to stand a better chance of responding correctly. Those are the some of the things that we've been looking at. We recently, I'll say in the last, we rolled it out sometime last summer. It's called um, eLerts, See Something, Say Something. It's a brand probably some people know, but we, we got hooked into it after doing some due diligence with some other different um, employee safety applications where we we tailored it specifically to St. Joe's. So now any and all of our employees, every single St. Joseph's, uh, Joseph's health employee can load this application on their phone and they'll be able to let us know with direct real-time two-way communication if there's an incident or an alert or something that's troubling them in their area. They can give us a snapshot, an image, they can upload it, they can upload a video file, audio file, they can show us that there's a slippery condition in the parking lot. They can show us that there's someone walking around that they think is uh, possibly flipping car handles on doors, that there is, that they need a security escort. They can push a, per, a personal panic alarm and let us know that they need help in their area. 
and we'll get their location and try to work with them and get them to a safe place. So if you put uh, the onus and you, you give them the ability to let us know at any point in time that there is a, uh, they have, they're unsafe, they feel unsafe. We can try to we can try to make them feel better. We can try to mitigate that risk for them, and that's been a tremendous step forward with showing them that we are engaged with them. That they are all they are, are is a literally a fingers push away from getting a hold of us. On their, I mean, my phone is kind of glued to my hand. I'm sure it's that way with a lot of people. So if you if you give your employees something like that, I think the uh, the benefit is tremendous. Awesome stuff. Now. I know there's a few different technologies you touched on there. I'm just curious, as far as the uh, the alerts that you receive, it so where where is that information being pulled from? I know I think of a company like Data Miner, for example. I know they pull from multiple resources. Where where are you getting that information? Just for anybody who might be uh, interested in learning more about that. So I, we actually looked at Data Miner, and they're a great company. We are actually working with uh, something called BNN Breaking News Network, and it's okay local to first responders and you have it's a basically a user generated id so if someone uploads that you know we're responding to a hazmat incident on fifth and main and so on and so forth we'll be able to identify that i i like that a little bit better because you're you're not just pulling stuff off of social media you're getting something that is sourced by someone that is a first responder that's locked into it i think that's kind of the key so it's more not to say the data miner is not reputable because I've had multiple conversations with some of their uh, individuals that are working with them. And I think they're great. I just want, I like it to be granular, really granular that you can dig into the details and say, this is what's important to me. I want to know, as I'm sure the majority of uh, healthcare uh, security executives want to know if, is there a rollover on route 80? Well, then I know I'm getting 20, possibly 20, 25 patients coming in. It's a patient surge. That's what I want to prepare for. I need to know that there's a fire downtown. I need to know that there is some type of demonstration two miles away. That's what I need to know. I don't need to know that there is um, a tornado out in Kansas right now. That's that's not going to affect me. I need to know what's going on in my little neck of the woods. That That's important to me. It's got to be granular. Excellent. And the, the other thing that you touched on too was the, uh, you know, in terms of AI, the facial recognition. And I, I want to do a, a little bit deeper dive into that as well. How are, how are some of the ways that you've been able to use facial recognition to support these initiatives as well? It's a great question. You know, we'll, we have our own little list, as I'm sure the vast majority of healthcare security professionals, executives do, of individuals that consistently come back, cause us a little bit of problems. Probably your, your BOLO list, your security watch list. So you have pictures. We've, we're fortunate enough to have a very high definition, closed circuit television system where we're able to upload high definition images so that we'll know when someone comes back it'll give us the email alert warning so we're not always glued to the to the monitor to the cctv but we'll get it on our phones we'll get it in in my dispatch center the the prevention of that the pushing of the 10 to 15 seconds where we have a head start is really really important you know masks obviously play a big role right now covid19 is still going on you know and in healthcare i think we're going to be wearing masks for some time but I, any edge you can get on that is important, not just but for preventative, but for investigations. It, it's great. It, we can get it live. We can get the alert live as to, you know, uh, suspect A has come onto property in the main lobby. But we can also look at a specific area camera and review footage that might have taken me 20, 30, 45, two, minute, two hours to look for a specific individual that came through a certain area or did a red backpack leave this area? When did this door open? When did someone go into this area that's closed? So we can set up rules and alerts to say, hey, someone just entered through the outpatient area and they shouldn't be in there at two o'clock in the morning. Well, what are they doing? Or if I'm looking to find a specific vehicle that went through my parking garage, you know, green Jeep, license plate X, Y, and Z, if we can get to that level of detail and we can you know, close that loop a little bit faster. So that's, those are some of the ways that we've been able to kind of use that, um, use that technology. That's awesome stuff. Now, uh, moving, moving away from technology, or, you know, I'm sure technology might be a part of this piece as well, but when we look at the strategies that you've implemented to reduce workplace violence, 
I'm just curious if you could share some of the strategies that you've implemented and, and the outcomes of those strategies, how it's really helped. Sure, absolutely. You know, again, we're exceedingly fortunate to have a large security force and um, administration senior management buys into, and they're very, very security focused and, you know, employee safety focused. So they've been, they've given us a, a large leash to try to in, improve safety and decrease workplace violence. Um, so obviously increase security ex- presence and expanded patrols. But in that, again, we're not just throwing bodies, throwing numbers, money at a problem. It's got to be targeted, it has to be targeted. So again, if you ask any of the other healthcare executive or security executives, they know that the majority of their workplace violence comes from the ED. So what are we going to do? We're going to target that. We're going to look at where in our facilities are the problem areas. And it's not just an extra security patrol or presence or camera or access control or panic button. It's how are we going to arm the individuals on the floor, the frontline workers with the ability to de-escalate. It doesn't have to become a workplace violence situation. If we can de-escalate the individual, that the patient, the visitor, give the staff, the frontline staff, the RNs, the PCAs, the doctors, the ability to de-escalate. They already have these skills. You got to bring it out of them. There's got to be some type of training program that helps them de-escalate, whether you're talking handle with care or CPI or uh, the Iron Temple, anything or Moab, anything along those lines. You've got to give them something that will teach them how to recognize, de-escalate, and get and make it. Let's you can't de-escalate everyone. So how are you going to get yourself out of the bad situation? Someone grabs your wrist. What do you do there? Someone grabs their hair. What do they do there? All those what I mentioned those uh, those um, trainings that I mentioned about thirty seconds ago teach you how to stop someone from hurting our, our employees. It turns what could just be, you know, a report in terms of someone grabbed someone's shirt. It stops there and it doesn't become a broken wrist. And now we have someone out on workers' comp. You know, th- there's got to be a little bit more than just putting the officer on the floor because it's not going to stop everything. Again, increased law enforcement presence. They've, again, been exceedingly helpful. We've worked with um, the emergency department the director of the ED, Janine Lamzon, and the uh, chief of the ED, uh, Dr. Neelish Patel. They've been instrumental in working with us and and creating and working on this, something called a BART program. It's a behavioral response so that if someone comes in and they come in with law enforcement, they're pulled in here or they're, they're out of control, they're on a stage. You know, they come in through the ambulance bay, everyone's on a stage. Everyone sees them acting out they're only going to continue to act out. We've got to control what is occurring to the best of our ability. Let's control the environment, take them off the stage, get them to a more secure area, be able to control the area around us. And everyone knows that there's so many different weapons or things that are in an ER room or a patient's room in a hospital that can fly and hurt someone. So control the environment best you can. You have one point person talking to them. You have specific medication available to the physicians in case they need to use that but get to the root of the cause. What's the problem with this individual visitor and or patient and try to deescalate from there. We did that about, I think we started maybe, I think sometime in early 19 and it's definitely helped decrease institutional violence in our, in our EDs. And we're going to see how we can do that with the rest of the healthcare system. It's not always the same in every area because they don't have the same amount of resources, but if you can use some level of that, it's going to help. It's not going to hurt. So uh, that's something that we've really, we're really proud of uh, in the ED. And then, you know, I talked about earlier about people need to be accountable for what they do, uh, security, law enforcement, anyone. So the emphasis to our frontline staff, anyone that is assaulted, is harassed, someone that has had something happen to them, is we need to make that individual accountable for their actions. So we all, we recommend, and of course there are extenuating circumstances if someone might be behavioral or if they have an issue and they act out, we get that. But we say, you may wanna consider pressing charges. You know, at, at a minimum, get a police report in case you feel you need to down the line because we want them to know that the system is gonna work. It's gonna work with them. We, security, are gonna walk with them, stand by them the whole time. 
I'll drive you down to the courthouse. You file the report. We'll stand there and sit there with you. We'll give you the, the, the uh, evidence in terms of whether it's pictures, CCTV, so on and so forth. So charges can be levied. We don't want to hurt anyone. We don't want to see anyone locked up, but I don't want our employees. I don't want my nurses and doctors getting hit. That's the bottom line. They are my patrons as well. That's who we work for. So, you know, we want them to know that if something happens, we're going to be there with them and we're going to help them hold people accountable. That's important. Absolutely. There's a couple of things that you mentioned there. The, the one thing I, I want to ask is uh, about something that you said early on was around the, the training piece. Now, mm -hmm. do you, does your team kind of take the lead in terms of training everybody in the, in the de-escalation? Are you guys involved with that part at all? So we are, but we've, several years ago, it was, everyone was kind of getting the same type of training through Handle With Care, which is a great program. You know, I've really, I've used it since, gosh, 2007, 2008 at different areas. But Handle With Care is, is, has a, a distinct flavor in terms of it, it's really useful for security. It's really useful for those types of individuals that are going to be, that could be going hands-on. We don't want to have to go hands-on if you're a frontline employee as a nurse. Right. We want them to understand a little bit of a different type of mentality. I don't want them having to put someone in the restraint hold and hold them down. That's my guy's job. That's what they're there to do. We want them to de-escalate. We want them to get out of the room. We want them to get to us, let us handle that job. I, The security officers, that team has a different mentality. They're there to de-escalate they're there to get stop the individuals from acting out but if they have to they're going to they're going to stop their action so that the medical team can then do what they need to do whether they need to medicate and so on so we do have a training role but our education department has developed their own de-escalation and prevention strategy that's based on a lot of handle with care approach and they do a fantastic job in teaching stephanie stephanie her who's the, uh, the director of education that handles that. They have an amazing team that really works hard in getting, getting those individuals to understand what de-escalation is. And Stephanie and her team are actually on the Workplace Violence Committee. And so when we are identifying via the data of our problem areas arise in that area, that's where we're going to target for a specific extra layer of training for the frontline staff. Is there new staff? Has something changed? Are they now seeing detox patients versus med surge area, so on and so forth. So what do we have to do to bring those numbers back down? And that, that's kind of a critical component for us. Excellent. Now, yeah, we've definitely covered uh, covered a lot in this conversation so far. And I, I just want to open it up to you because I, you know, I, I've been, I've been hitting you with a lot of questions. Is, is there anything that I haven't asked you yet that you'd like to discuss? Well, just, you know, one of the quick things going, uh, you know, I talked about data. Um, all of those things worked for me. You know, it worked for St. Joe's, it worked for our department, but, you know, things don't always stay the same, you know, you're going to see spikes and then what do you do about that? So back in 2013, 14, when I really started sinking my teeth into, I was the manager at that point, I started sinking my teeth into um, uh, workplace violence. We had well over a hundred incidents, ported incidents per year. Over the next several years, we we're able to drop that number down to, you know, below 30 and in the ED, Seven, there were at a minimum of reported 70 incidents. So if you, if you do the quick math, 70% of our uh, workplace violence incidents were in the ED. And we, again, then we were able to get that number down into the, into the 20s. But then what happens? Something changes in your world. There's a new street drug. There's whatever. Workplace violence numbers shot up in um, 2019. I was like, wow, what the heck just happened? You go back to it. You keep tweaking. You do more training, you find out what's going on in the community, you get some resources out there, you work with your local leaders and you put and, and you may need to put more money into your program and or, or change the way you, you run it uh, to a certain extent and you get those numbers to come back down. It's a little bit of a cat and mouse game, but then we were able to get it to come back down to 2020 and 2021 in the first uh, couple of months. So it's always a battle to keep those numbers where you want them to be as low as you can with the knowledge that at some point, you know, something's going to change, something will change and you're going to have to uh, rework that mousetrap. You know, one of the things that I was just thinking about, because any healthcare you know, security executive is going to tell you that you spent a lot of time and money on your team, building your team, 
retention, retention. You don't want to lose your, your good core officers, right? You know, you spend a lot of time and money on them. And at some point, individuals that want to move on to become a, a law enforcement, firefighter, you know, they're going to move on. Uh, I have lots of officers that moved on to become like Port Authority police investigators, state police, FBI. I, I love it. I'm, I'm actually happy about that. It, it's weird. I'm, I'm saying I'm happy I'm losing good quality guys. Why? Because I know that our program works and we can do it again. So what are we going to do to continually bring in good quality staff and train them to the best of our ability? I'd rather have the guy, the officer that I know is going to leave me in two years because he's going to become a cop because I'm going to less have, have, most likely have less problems with that officer. And then I feel as if we have, you know, the, my, my security manager, Russ here, has this phrase. He goes, you know, you have all these little disciples out there in the world, Chris, all these guys <laughs> that started here and they're now somewhere out there in New Jersey and beyond. And they always, and they'll, they'll always remember. And true to form, you keep up with a lot of them and they come back and they say, hi, and how can we help you? And hey, I need a favor here. And it's, it, it, it feels like an extended family. So while it stinks in the moment, if you lose a good core officer, we should also be happy that we know that our program is, is training them and giving them that extra oomph, that extra edge to become that first responder, that lawyer that whatever that they become to be i, I think that's um something that we should celebrate then get back and recruit more people absolutely and i you know i agree with you 100 there i think one of the one of the old organizations i used to work at we i had i found another way to track turnover so i i tracked it as positive and negative turnover so it was negative when somebody left because you know they, they went to do the same job somewhere else and got paid you know 50 cents or a buck more an hour but it was positive when people were leaving to get into law enforcement, when they were leaving to get into corrections, Absolutely. you know, fire services, like you had alluded to, or if they wanted to get into, they wanted to take that next step in their healthcare security career, but there wasn't anywhere for them to go within the organization right. because, you know, there, there just weren't positions available. Right. So I, I viewed that as positive turnover and kind of sold it that way. And that was, that was something that I found helpful, but it's, I guess it's one of the positive consequences of you know, that, that you have being a good leader and empowering people and, and training them up. You always have to kind of have that balance of, you know, having that good bench strength. If you, if you want to use a sports analogy, who's up next type of thing. Yep. Agreed. Awesome. Now, I guess in terms of, um, as we actually, as we start to wrap up here, do you have a, a special message that you'd like to share with the healthcare security cast community? Healthcare, in my opinion, healthcare security Healthcare itself is about serving those that need help. It's our communities. You know, I, I love, you know, New Jersey. You know, I was born in New Jersey. There's really no better place to get good pizza. And I know the guys in New York are going <laughs> to disagree with me. Good pizza and bagels, but no. But, you know, New Jersey has this distinct feeling that, you know, it, there's a lot going on. There's always something going on. And our communities deserve help and aid. And they need to know that we're there for them. You know, St. Joe's, we're a healing ministry. You know, we are sponsored by the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth. And their big push is, you know, providing health, health care with a special concern for those that are poor, vulnerable, and underserved. And I think that is something that we all have to remember because, yeah, you can go to any ED in the country and get treated. Absolutely. But it's the ones that, that push to make that, that caring connection and the officers, our officers, any healthcare security officer doesn't need to be that big gruff guy at the door, but they got it. It's customer service first. And how can I help you? Anyone that walks into a healthcare in, uh, agency or system, they're scared. They're worried. They are petrified. You know, they're there. They're either worried about their own health or their loved one's health. Even on you know, a joyous occasion like a birth, it can go wrong real quick. And our officers need to under, remember that customer service is key and we're going to try to treat them with respect and help them and get to the root of the problem and try to stop it before it becomes big. And if you can, if your officer at the front lobby or at the main entrance can give them a smile and try to deescalate them and say, it's going to be okay, we'll help you out as best we can, that's going to go a long way. Customer service, your patient satisfaction scores, and just the overall 
feeling of the way the community views not only the security and safety department, but the healthcare uh, system as a whole. That's the, you're the ambassador. And, you know, we need to remember that we, there's a time to say, this is the line and you're not crossing it, but there's also a time to say, you know, we're going to help you out here. And I, I'm, I'm sure that all my colleagues that are listening to this, they know that, you know, and it's just sometimes we need to remember that as leaders, we got to keep pushing that message. It really is important. And if I just um, could very quickly say a thank you, my my command staff, you know, my you know, my guys, Russ, Russ Mead, he's the manager of security and safety at the Patterson campus, Bajo Molesky at, at the Wayne campus, he's been here. A long time he's he's one he's like one of my right hand guys uh israel Pena, who i mentioned before who uh handles all of our systems and our projects uh, just a wealth of knowledge and information and if you want to sort of talk about a big nerd he's even bigger than me bigger nerd than me in that asif kawaja who uh oversees parking you know and then my investigative leads roger cameron and kevin khan couldn't ask for a finer finer set of individuals as my command staff that just buy into the mission of saint joe's work is exceedingly hard and um, are always there and they just they 99 times out of 100 they do the right thing and they always work hard so I, I cannot thank them enough for getting us to where we are and I know where we're gonna go you know in the future so thank you to them they're the ones that really make things work with the officers in the field amazing and it's it's always important to recognize those who are making the contribution so I'm glad you uh, you took the time to do that now, uh, for anyone who wants to connect with you, what's the what's the best way to do so? I'm on LinkedIn, Christopher Johnston, St. Joseph's Health. You know, if you wanted to email me directly at uh, my, my work email, it's johnstoc, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-C at S-J-H-M-C dot org. So uh, happy to connect with any healthcare uh, security executive and or, or work with anyone to see if there's something we can do together however we can uh, continue our, our mission forward. Awesome. Well, Chris, I appreciate the time today. Thank you so much for this conversation. I, I really enjoyed having the discussion with you. Thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate it. The Healthcare Security Cast is available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music and Audible, and many other platforms as well. Check out our link tree on your computer or mobile device. And this can be found at linktree slash Brian Hamilton. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot ee slash brine b-r-i-n-e hamilton again that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot ee slash brine hamilton or if it's easier send me a text at 647-372-2042 that's 647-372-2042 and i'll be happy to answer any questions you may have or share any links you may be looking for thanks again for listening until next time take care and stay safe Thank you.